So we have with us three international leaders, and could, could three of you come up front and sit in these three chairs? In order to prepare for this talk, could you please provide us with a brief description of two principles about leadership that you have learned and would like to share? We'll be collecting two principles from each of you, and then, so, so each of you are going to share for about 12 minutes, really things that God has taught you in the, in the, in the context of leadership. And then we're just going to have interaction around those principles. And um, as I said before, hopefully deepen our understanding, both of other cultures, but, but also of our own cultures. Back to me. Is on. Um, I'm Finney Phillip. I'm based in northwestern part of India. Um, I'm a principal for a Bible college and seminary, which trains leaders for the growing church in the northern part of India. And uh, the last 30 plus years, God has raised about 1,600 churches and 300,000 plus believers first generation in that region. So my role is to develop leaders to that. Um, along with that, uh, other hats I wear, uh, regional director for Lausanne Movement, involved in publishing, involved in educational transformation, and the rest. It's all basically to serve the church and make the church stronger. In my past years, about 24 years in North western part of India and North India, God has enabled me to learn a lot of things uh, in leadership uh, by making lots of mistakes and also to learn from others how to avoid mistakes. I'll be sharing two things. Um, first thing is uh, biblical leadership is it's like being like a mother. Um, that concept has emerged from my own life, uh, seeing how my mother functioned in a traditional Indian family. Um, always, my mother eat last, which means that she prepares food for us, then serve us, and then at the end, then she eats. There is a tremendous uh, amount of giving others attitude in, uh, in mother. You know, I, I know that it's always the same in your own culture. Mothers uh, give extreme care for others. And that just triggered me to learn from First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, the second part. You know, I was like a nursing mother among you, Paul says, and his team was believing that kind of constant. When I moved to northern part of India, I married to a uh, missionary daughter. Um, and she was born, up, born and brought up in North India with a missionary family with a lot of struggles they have gone through. But I've heard stories when pastors from mission fields come to their home, the mother would even take the food of the children and give and feed the pastors and the guests who are at home. There I learned that the family eat last in a mission context, which helped the organization to be a very stable, consistent work. Even after the founder passed away, the leadership stood strong because the mother cared for the larger church in a way that would you know normally don't happen um and from there i you know i moved into my own life and started learning and applying some of these principle and then i put the next level of knowledge which is leaders eat last um if leadership you know this is counter or Countercultural in the sense that general leadership is one up, you know, you just go up in your leadership because of your skills and qualities. 
but i i started learning this lesson that if you really value and advance others the loyalty and trust of your coworkers will be greater towards you there was an incident in which um i initiated a, a evangelical publishing uh, a, a magazine and uh, there was nothing of a high quality english magazine for evangelical christians in india and south asia so god enabled us to start that and i have the first person to join me was a theological graduate very literally skilled so he joined as a single person but then he came when he came he started sharing about his uh, future and his fiance and he then suddenly said that my family and myself want to marry this girl but her family is not interested because i am a christian worker and that was a big problem for him but later both uh, this person and his fiance planned to get married without the consensus of her uh, of her parents and in that point of time um i stepped in into this situation and helped do everything that the wedding happened in a most beautiful way and covered them and strengthened them to have their family life started although the girl's family was very much uh, anguished and was very much against us but later in a two years time everything became so normal and the families were reconciled and it was so good and at that point i had to face a lot of shame and honor because as a leader i would not jump into such a crisis and acknowledge a marriage which is not very normal in our situation and as a result this person and family had greater loyalty and trust to the work that we were doing and so that was a lesson which i learned that when you put your heart out to the other and advance for the well-being of the the other one the loyalty and trust would be of a higher level so leader being the quality of a mother helps a lot as second point out of that is um i always believe in birthing process um because we are in a first generation christian environment everything in in front of you is a need and you need to initiate something to cover or to take care of a, a of an issue that the church is facing in many of those situations you have a vision and you look for someone to come and help you and so you can either look at a person who come and help you as a staff working out your vision or a person on whom the vision can be imparted and he can run with this so i will always look for such people and allow them to birth the vision rather than me doing the vision for them it's a painful process but at the end of the birthing this person will start saying well this is mine <laughs> and so that has helped the work a lot the second point i want to mention is a uh, it's mostly of a of the negative side in the sense that i learned the mistake from the mistake and then i moved out uh, is the trap of delegating upwards um delegating upwards is basically um you have you have given a task to someone but it has come back to you and then you complete the task um i am a kind of perfectionist in many sense and particularly uh in the printing and publishing area of my work i i want the quality of the materials very high and the design to be nicely done so in many situations the designer will come and uh, you know say that you don't have the time or i am not getting the concept um instead of spending time with him and help him to grow i would say oh you just uh, send it to my uh, by email to me and i will work on it and then you can proceed and as a result i have accumulated 
huge workloads and i'm being known as a person he's a very busy man don't go and disturb him kind of you know uh, name but the lord helped me to learn this factor that the time of reworking on a a, a delegation that came upward can be more than actually sitting with that person and guiding him so that he can do the job uh so in terms of time management instead of dealing it getting it upwards you just spend time with that guy whom you have already given the job correct him send him okay him so these are two areas which i learned in my personal life as a leader back in india thank you thank you it's a joy to be here my name is quite a long one four long african names so normally i just save i just save you with the first one and when you call me nana it's great the second one is yao it simply means i was born on thursday so if you come into our context and you know the day on which you were born the day of the week i can easily tell you your ghanian name and you can easily make ghanian friends that way uh, the family name is ofei ewuku that one you inherit from your father so that's how it goes um i've been working with the scripture union for the past 20 years and um for the past 6 years being much more involved with the Lausanne movement so with the scripture union i serve as the director for our field ministries uh, responsible for about 1600 schools in Ghana um into producing devotional and bible study material with the Lausanne movement for the past 5 years i have served as the regional director for the english portuguese spanish uh, speaking countries and since last august i have been invited to lead the 10 year younger leader generation initiative so much of what i will be sharing if you are a senior leader in a kind of a ceo board position think downwards towards the people you want to help that kind of a thing the two principles i want to share on first healthy leaders keep first things first secondly helpful leaders do not despise the vision of the mustard seed so you could just keep healthy helpful and round each of those i will want to share um three quick principles and then probably a few personal stories that make it meaningful healthy leaders keep first things first it's been a long journey for me um you can tell that these my two brothers in jackets they have been on the road far longer than myself and i'm sure most of you my life has come with quite some surprises in the leadership journey and many of them hit me hard the one who suffered most was my wife because she knew what was happening in the bedroom outsiders will praise and encourage in many ways she was the one who saw much of the pain many of these principles come from that perspective so healthy leaders keep first things first in 2009 i had gone on my usual rounds i came back went to just take a nap and then i tried to get up and when i was getting up i tried 
in the normal way I do it always, and I couldn't get up. I didn't know that getting up was a difficult exercise. I turned into a different position. I tried to get up. I couldn't get up. Forgive sometimes our ego as men. When you think that you can do it all by yourself. With two attempts not succeeding, I now stretched on my bed and kind of working out a fitness exercise. <clears throat> Tried to get up that way. Then I had a pull, sharp pull in the left side of my chest. It was only then I remembered that I had a wife at home. Joy! She rushed in. I said, I can't get up. And my wife is a physician, a medical doctor. So what do you mean by you can't get up? I said, I can't get up. She said, try this. It didn't work. Try this. It didn't work. She said, do this. It didn't work. Then all of a sudden, she got pale. Held me. Moved me up. It was the first time in my life that for two weeks I was bedridden. And when the lab reports came in, my wife was terrified. Cutting long story short, friends, doctors took me through all kinds of things. And one who was very close to me, head of radiology of one of our big hospitals, said, Nana, We've checked everything. There is nothing wrong with your body. You are too stressed up. Whatever it is, stop. It was an angina pectoris condition that was developing at such a rate almost to take my heart under 40 years. That's when some of these things came very close to me. I thought that I was somebody who, in growing up as a leader, really wanted to please people. And so I will go all out, stretch myself out. And as a perfectionist, every little mistake I make was breaking me. That's when I discovered in John 4 and 34, my food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. What stood out for me there was what I've now come to call the 2 W principle. His focused first on the will of him who sent him before finishing his work. And I realized that I had turned the principle around. Finishing his work, giving the numbers, seeing many young people come to Christ, big programs, was taking precedence on doing his will. Since then, it's become for me a leadership principle everywhere. His first expectation of you as a leader is to do his will. I came to the conclusion that if I will please him, that is my first assignment. It is out of doing his will that the strength to finish his work will come. I find this not only a New Testament principle, I find it right in Genesis as well. And that changed me in the perception of my own identity. If I tell you my background story, where I came from, all through there was a huge issue with identity. Who am I? If a leader is not able 
to clearly define your identity, source of leadership strength is gone. And I was growing through various leadership crises with the issue of identity not settled. What I came to discover with identity is just the creation norm. And God said, let us make man in our own image, in our likeness. So he made man in his image, in his likeness, male and female, he made them. Then from verse 28, the issue of work or stewardship came in. He blessed them that they should multiply, giving them the responsibility to rule. I came to understand he made us first to be human beings, not human doings. And there is so much of leadership that tends towards the doing side that makes it look as if that is leadership. Vision, strategy, action plans, evaluations, measurements. He made us first to be in his image. And I realized that lifetime growth as a leader comes first and foremost only when we grow in his image. It is only there that our inner energy and source for the stewardship mandate comes. Anytime you turn it around in leadership, forget it. You might have come across the statistic, I think originally done by Bobby Clinton, Robert Clinton, that seven out of ten leaders don't finish well. And two weeks before this time, leading the Lausanne Younger Leaders generation, the Younger Leaders so concerned, discussing why leaders fail and why they don't finish well. And we have so many expectations of them and their concern is how do we finish well? And Bobby Clinton gave five reasons why Leaders don't finish well, and five markers on why leaders finish well. I can't get into all of that, but one of the things that he says that strikes me, he says leaders who finish well, they intentionally carve out their God time for daily moment-by-moment moment renewal. First things first. Finally, if you don't lead effectively, successfully, fruitfully in your private life, I came to realize your public leadership is very limited. It won't go very far. The private life of your own thoughts or of your own heart, or of your own disciplines, the disciplines that work out that make you strong in leadership, the private life of family, if it doesn't go that way, please, that would be a recipe for disaster along the way. The second one is very much like what my dear brother Finney said. I have said helpful leaders do not despise the vision of the mats that seed. That's one of the most precious gifts I've had since last month. It's a gift from Blair Carlson, who for 26 years served as the International Crusade Director for Billy Graham, and that's a live mustard seed, so small. And what he said was that, whatever you are into, if it is about the kingdom, no matter how small it begins, it has the God potential, the God power to multiply. 
And what I will say very briefly on that, number one, please see the Peters in the Simons around you. So I'm only playing on the words of Jesus who meets Peter, Simon, and say, you will be called Peter. I'm sure that many of us here, maybe yours as well, if anybody said to you that you will be in this leadership role today, you may not have believed it. I come from a background like that. If anybody ever said, Nana, you will be at ELF on a panel this year, some years back, never would I have believed it. Just this morning, I was telling Michael Cassidy, founder, leader of African Enterprise, leader, great work with Billy Graham over 50 years. There was a program in South Africa. I saw the program itself in India. He is giving a speech. I'm following him. And I said, Michael, if I saw that program in Ghana, I would have given an excuse and not come. I was so afraid. It was amazing how Michael Cassidy took me on that journey right till this morning when I had breakfast with him. Please don't look out only for talents, smart talents. God's treasure may be in someone who surrounds you very weak. Look at the heart. Look at the head. Look at the hands. And even if you find a weakness there, is a discernment journey. Who does God want you, really? I am sure that many of you are leading big things, so that may not really apply. But if it's kingdom and it's starting small, I want to really encourage you. Bobby Clinton said again, those who look at leadership from a lifetime perspective, they end well. So it's not, if God has called you to it, it's not something to stop now, and there are phases of growth, it will come. I think I will end it there and then pick up the interaction. Thank you. Uh, my name is Atif Gendi. Uh, I grew up in the southern part of Egypt. Now I live in Cairo. By training, I was a civil engineer, and uh, then I gave some time of my life to establish a training center in the south uh, to uh, help or equip lay leaders uh, keep their churches open until they receive pastors. Uh, then when I realized that I want to continue in uh, ministry, I went to the seminary where I serve now uh, and uh, studied theology, then went to Aberdeen, get Master of Theology and PhD in New Testament. Currently, uh, since 2000, uh, I am the president of that seminary in Cairo, the Evangelical Theological Seminary in Cairo, and professor of New Testament. Uh, I will share with you two uh, two lessons or that I learned the hard way. <laughs> same way like my uh, colleagues. The first one is leaders must avoid escaping or hiding during difficult times. And the second is ab uh, about leaders need not to lose vision. They, shouldn't av they should avoid turning to be routine maintainers. Uh, Leaders must avoid escaping or hiding during the uh, times of challenges or difficult times. Um, since the Arab Spring, we were going through very difficult time in uh, our part of the world, in the Middle East and in Egypt. Uh, the church suffered a lot in many ways. Uh, in, in my country, we are 
relatively better than what's going on in Syria, Libya, Iraq, and so on. But even though we went through very uh, difficult time, many of people uh, sought immigration or asylum and so on. Uh, a story happened to me and was uh, a great uh, lesson and message from one of my students. During summer, we, uh, uh, we send our Master of Divinity students to get some training in uh, some of the churches. So one of the students called Adil, uh, we sent to a s town, town in the south called Dalga. And uh, this uh, church is without pastor for several years. He was a third year student, so usually they can handle uh, church in, in this situation. But the Dalga, this town, was very much uh, uh, heavily uh, occupied by fundamentalists, Muslim fundamentalists, who caused big problems even to, to the, the, the limit that police couldn't uh, get to certain districts at, certain, at that time for about three months because they had weapons and they were doing great damage to Christians and to moderate Muslims as well. Uh, in the day where uh, the revolution and demonstrations were very heavy and forced uh, or asked the army to get in and uh, forced Morsi and Muslim Brotherhood to step down, uh, the hit back from Muslim Brotherhood was very aggressive of killing, shooting people in the streets and burning about 100 churches or church premises in Egypt in, in one day. One of these churches was Dalga, where my student Adel was there. And actually, it was not just burning the church, but they were burning the houses of Christians to the limit that moderate Muslims were trying to, uh, to uh, uh, help Christians escape or hide them in their houses. And sometimes they even uh, built uh, like a break to, uh, uh, instead of the door so that the, these tourists do not know where is the door of this Christian house. So I called Adil and asked him, I said, Adil, please come back to Cairo. It's very unsafe in your day. The church was burning. And uh, I told him, we will re reassign you another uh, church to serve in. And I was surprised, and he told me, Dr. Atif, uh, I cannot say no to you, but this time I need to say no. I cannot leave my people uh, at this moment. I cannot leave them at this hard time. And he insisted to stay there. It was quite dangerous, quite risky. But I, I myself learned a very important lesson that the, uh, the time of hardship and turmoil is not the time where leaders need to think how to save themselves, but how to support and serve and be with their people. You cannot imagine the impact of that on the life of Christ, simple Christians in this village how they loved this man, how they felt supported just because he stayed with them at that difficult time. This reminds me with what Jesus says in uh, John 10, when three categories of people claim to be shepherds. The first is the good shepherd, he who is always there for the sheep. He is willing to make himself a door or gate to save them. And this is where in the Middle East, when uh, uh, the shepherd probably uh, uh, gets some time late and cannot go back, 
and they look for a cave and usually the cave wouldn't be with a door. So he put the sheep inside and he sleeps outside and became like a door. So if there is a thief or a fox or any animal would get in the cave, he will step on or step over that person. He cannot get in without the shepherd uh, 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 sensing first that there is a danger and resists that. Then the second one is the thief who uh, looks like he comes in as if he is a shepherd, but he comes just to steal, to gain benefits, and exploits the, the uh, flock. He kills, destroys, causes whatever damage he can uh, 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 cause for the, uh, the flock. The third one is the hired uh, the, th the third one is the um, hired hand and though he doesn't harm or destroy uh, the sheep like the thief but he escapes when danger happen uh, he doesn't stand the danger when wolf attacks the flock the hired hand runs away to save himself and uh, I think this is an important message. I thank God that most of the leaders in my country during the difficult time, we decided to stay with our people and uh, uh, um, not to immigrate or do anything. It's not uh, uh, something brave we did, but the blessings the Lord has given us was much more than we deserve. Important lesson that I would leave here with you. The second thing is leaders need not to lose vision. They, they, shouldn't avo they should avoid turning to be routine maintainers. During my 25 years of uh, service in the seminary, I am always keen to attend the admission committee. And I, I am, uh, we interview students, especially those who uh, uh, we, uh, come to be in the Master of Divinity, the ordination track. We give very thorough time for uh, psychological tests and uh, examining their call and the vision, skills, everything you can imagine. We spent uh, huge time with each student to make sure that we are admitting the right person. Usually, uh, people come with amazing call and vision for which they say, I was uh, a f medical doctor or I am a medical doctor, I am a, a successful teacher, I am a, an engineer, but the Lord has called me, I, will, I want to leave these things, I don't know how I would live, but I want to do so and so amazing things you hear about, and I have no reason to doubt uh, the faithfulness of those people and how genuine they are. In many cases, unfortunately, as those people graduate and became pastors, you see very little of what they promised to be or wished to be, and you find them very routinely pastors, uh, turning to be just routine maintainers, preaching s number of, of, of sermons every week, having an annual mission conference or conference uh, uh, sometime in summer, and probably having a general uh, committee once a year or so. And as long as they do these things, they are pastors. It hit me very much that in 2011, we had the Synod of the Nile, which is the, the highest uh, committee or governing body for the Presbyterian Church w to which I belong. We were gathered about 400 pastors and elders, and in the, the, the large church, Castro Dubara, 
nearby Tahrir Square where the revolution was there. So we, we had difficult time uh, to go through the demonstrations and attend the, uh, uh, the, the meetings of the Senate. What happened that we were discussing as usual, very routinely, old staff reporting about committees that gathered a, a year ago and so, uh, financial reports and so on, and one simple guy from a village, I think he's, he sound illiterate, uh, wearing what we call galabia, he's very rural, and he stood and rebuked us all. And he said, are you the, the leaders of the church? The country is burning around us. People are, some of them are in prison, some are killed, and the country is on fire, and you are just discussing uh, uh, old reports about meeting of uh, this presbytery or that presbytery. Where are you from what's going on in our country? This was the message that when you lose vision, you just be routine maintainer. I read a, a true story uh, about Walt Disney uh, in his uh, last days. He was very weak uh, in intensive care and he was not allowed visits uh, as he was about to give his final breath. And one of the paparazzi, you know, the, the uh, uh, journalists or so, tried to have a speech with him. He was not allowed visits, but this paparazzi managed to escape and in illegal way, <laughs> get in the room, got in the room. And uh, uh, he tried to speak with him about the project that was claimed about the Disney World uh, that he wanted uh, to create a, a whole city for amusement and leisure, not just for children, but for families that would have also some educational uh, principles and concepts. And he told him that I need to talk to you about your vision in that, about that. He had the, the uh, like outline or layout for the, uh, the city hang on the wall and he asked the man to bring it and put it on the ground. He was sleeping. Uh, he turned to be sleeping on his uh, belly and he started to uh, explain to him bit by bit what he meant. And as he was speaking about his vision, his voice became a bit louder and healthier because he was speaking about his vision. And this man's conclusion was, was like that. The vision is what brings one excited to think of and talk about even while one is giving his last breath. Vision is what, what brings one excited to think of and talk about even while one is giving his last breath. It's very important that we live for something, guys. Um, Again, when I think of Jesus, he did, he made lots of things of uh, teaching, preaching, cleaning the temple, uh, healing people, and so on. But this never was his ultimate goal. We read about him that uh, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. And uh, uh, we read also in Luke 9 that Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Having clear vision helps us to avoid distraction, 
helps us not to turn to be routine, routine maintainers, helps us to know what to do, when to do, what not to do things, when to, do, to stop doing things, when to say it's not the, 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 my hour, uh, uh, and when to say the hour has come to do something. Thank you.